Uh, welcome. Tonight is um, our deep dive on dealing with the heat. And one of my favorite things to do, I'm going to go ahead and pull my presentation up. I love my big words. And we are uh, desktop. That's not what I wanted. This is what I wanted. Uh, we are at no shortage of big words tonight. Um, this is a uh, blue footed booby. As in, probably tell it's a really old picture. I pulled this this one out of the uh, the archives from when I was in college. Um, and they nest on the ground, and it is hot there. Uh, they're right on the in the. This is in the Galapagos along the equator. It's pretty warm there. They nest on the ground. There's no kind of uh, protection. Obviously, you know they can't buy sunshade or anything like that. So they're dealing with some pretty extreme temperatures. And you can see this um, individual has their mouth open, uh, and that's one of the ways that they're. Um, helping to deal with the heat. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about dealing with the heat. Uh, so the question really is, you know, where to start? Where should we start? And I think that we're all in agreement. I should start by talking about enzymes. Um, enzymes are proteins. They act as a catalyst in a biochemical reaction. If you want to go right from the Oxford Dictionary of Biology. Um, uh, in, in this graph here, hopefully you guys can see my, uh, my mouse here. You know, you, you you have an energy that's required to make a reaction happen. Enzymes that they bind, and I, I don't want to get too much into biochemistry, so I'm not trying to use all the terms. But when enzymes are present, they can help bind a, and catalyze in, uh, a reaction so that the energy, um, the, the amount of energy needed to make the reaction happen is much, much lower. Uh, and that's a really big deal. It's a big deal for us because the uh, reaction still might happen, but it's going to happen slower and it's going to require more energy. Um, and for life, enzymes are extremely important because they allow these reactions to happen quicker uh, so that life can occur as we know it today. Uh, and certainly they allow it to happen with less energy. So enzymes are really, really important. The tricky part about enzymes is they need, um, they have a, a, a certain requirements. Um, it's kind of like a, a, a really famous uh, actor or singer or somebody who like you got to give me all these things in my dressing room. They need um, a very often a very um, narrow range of temperature and pH, uh, and they often need a certain amount of uh, the substrate, the the uh, um, uh, whatever the material is that's going to react. So if they don't have those things, it's important. Since we're talking about dealing with the heat, the 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 piece of this that's really important for what we're discussing tonight is. Um, the temperature portion of it. And if your body is not at the right temperature, it's very possible that these enzymes might not work or perhaps they could work too well and that could be an issue as well. So having the proper temperature um, is a big deal. So of course, if we're talking about enzyme, now that we're gonna, now we're getting a little close to temperature, I do wanna talk about heat because I wanna make sure we're also on the same page with that. Heat is energy and it's transferred. So when something is cold, it's not because it, it contains cold, it's because it has lost heat or it is in relation to something else much cooler so it draws heat out of that object. So when you touch something that's cold, you feel that sensation, you're feeling heat loss. Um, so heat is very important. We are, there are times of the year where we want to retain our heat. We don't want to lose that energy. And there are times of the year, obviously, where we would very much like to lose uh, a lot of that energy. So understanding how heat moves, excuse me, is, is going to be important. And then all this comes to thermal regulation. This is regulating your body temperature by any means. It can be physiological. It can be behavioral. Uh, and very often it's usually uh, some combination of both that is going to give you or keep you in the, the range of temperature that you need. Um, we don't have too many extreme temperatures here. You know, it does get warm, and if you've been watching the, the forecast, it's certainly going to get warm coming up here over the next few days. Um, but we're not dealing with, you know, extreme temperatures like you would see in, uh, you know, a, a desert ecosystem, which um, can be really, really uh, crazy. Um, and I also want to mention evaporation because we're going to come back to this a couple times. Um, the bottles here are showing condensation not evaporation, but if that, if those water droplets um, are begin to evaporate, um, that's key because evaporation is 
uh, when that when the uh, water goes from a liquid state to a vapor state, it's taking some energy with it, and that can be very important for cooling. Uh, and that happening in different parts of the body can be a, a really, really important thing. So here is a, a liquid, and these little red dots all represent liquid particles. They're, they have some move, movement, and they're, the temperature of this liquid is typically an average of the movement of all these kinetic particles. So some of the particles are moving slower. Some of the particles are moving very fast. Some of the particles are able to escape the liquid because they have a high enough kinetic energy that they can escape the liquid and um, become a gas. So they've made that state change from a, a liquid to a gas without actually being boiled. Obviously, boiling can do it faster and, and happen much quicker and a lot more um, can uh, be evaporated at one time. But it is possible that some of these particles are able to move from a liquid to a gas without being boiled. And so that's what, I'll come back here with evaporation, the liquid turns to a vapor without its temperature actually reaching a boiling point. Um, and eventually, most of, depending on um, how dry the air is, that can happen to the entirety of that liquid if it's left out long enough in dry enough conditions. So um, let's talk about what's, um, some of these animals do because different animals we, we we're very much locked into still uh talking about cold-blooded and warm-blooded um and luckily for me in my topic it's a lot more complicated than that um we're uh, you know, I grew up, it was cold blood animals and warm blood animals. Cold blood animals, their, temp their body temperature changes with the environment. Warm blood animals, their body temperature stays the same regardless of the environment. Sure and sure, um, but again, it does get more complicated than that. Generally, when we talk about cold blood animals, we're referring to ectothermic animals. And these are animals that maintain their body temperature within fairly narrow limits because, again, they can't go the full range of temperatures that that we know exists because that would not be good for their body. And again, you got to remember the enzymes. Um, so they their body temperature can change within fairly narrow limits. Uh, and they do it by behavioral means. They don't have internal mechanisms that can help them to maintain that temperature. So here are a couple of uh, map turtles. This is from up in Pennsylvania, and they are out basking in the sun. Um, and water plays a huge part of this. If you're an aquatic animal uh, and your body temperature is affected by the environment because it doesn't maintain its own temperature like a like in a mammal or a bird if you are an ectotherm when you go into that water it's going to begin taking some of that heat away and depending unless you have adaptations for that and a lot of times those adaptations are uh, being a little bit bigger um i think if you know the majority of the turtles that we have around here that are aquatic are larger than the box turtle uh, who is terrestrial, can't swim. If you put a box turtle in water, it's, it's going to drown if it's in water over its head. Um, and part of that, part of the reason for that is once you go in the water, you start losing heat. The bigger you are, the less, uh, the more volume you have, your volume to surface area ratio, if it's higher, you're, you have a better chance to retain that heat. I always um, like to think of, I'll give you the idea of if you've got a bowling ball, and you got a golf ball and they're but, but they're both um spheres that are made of metal that golf ball obviously is going to cool down quicker uh, and it's not just because it's small and it's got less heat but it's also got a higher ratio of surface area to volume i just switched it on you so i apologize um whereas the surface area to volume ratio of the the bowling ball is is not as high it's much lower and so it's going to take longer for that heat to to uh, be given off if you heated both of those metal balls up now obviously eventually it'll lose most of its heat as well, um, but it's gonna stay warmer much longer. The bowling ball size ball will stay uh, warmer much longer than the golf ball size ball. Um, and so if you're a turtle and you're going into the water, which is gonna be cooler, um, and water tends to take uh, temperature more quickly, uh, absorb uh, heat more quickly than air, um, you wanna warm yourself up before you go in. This is a, the reason you see uh, water snakes bask a lot. Um, because they're about to go into water and that's going to sap some of their their energy. Uh, water snakes also tend to be thicker bodied so that they can hold in that heat a little longer as well. Um, and here's a fun term. I believe I'm supposed to say this is poikilotherm. Um, and this is an organism whose body temperature varies according to the temperature of its surroundings. So what that means is um, they do, you know, they can bask and they can get warmer, but their body temperature is going to go up and down with the, the ambient temperature of the day. 
what that often means is they might have um, different enzymes in their body that work at different temperatures. And so they might have more enzymes to do um, similar things to, more, um, I'll get to them at endotherms, because their body temperature might be cooler in the morning versus higher in the middle of the day and then cooler again later. And so they may have several different enzymes that help them to get through their um, get their body through the reactions they need because they're going to be dealing with different temperatures and the enzymes only work um, or, or maximally uh, optimally work at different temperatures. And so they could have a range of, of enzymes to help them do similar things where other animals who are keeping their body temperature roughly the same may not need that range of enzymes because they're staying within a much more narrow range uh, that's very constant. Um, and frogs are the classic example of poikilotherms. Um, some fish can be like that too, depending on where they live. Some fish can can keep a very um, uh, I'm blanking on the word, very uh, static temperature as well. Um, here's a nice graph um, I found on uh, on Wikipedia. This this green object in the middle is supposed to be a lizard. The uh, and these are three temperature bars between the day. Uh, using my cursor and pointing at it like you can see my finger the day the night and the day and you can see the red is the ambient temperature it's cool at night um, begins to warm up as the sun comes up uh, and you reach this this maximum temperature throughout the day and then it goes back down into the overnight temperature and then it'll obviously crest again the next day the green is the temperature of this brown object which is supposed to be the lizard's burrow um, and so the, the temperature in that lizard's burrow stays fairly Excuse me. I love air conditioning. Excuse me. The um, temperature of the lizard's burrow stays fairly the same throughout the day, regardless of the ambient temperature. The purple is the lizard's body temperature. So, um, you know, the lizard's body temperature is actually cooler than the burrow until early morning. Uh, and the lizard is able to come out, warm up in the sun, but it doesn't want to reach the same temperature, full temperature of the day. So it'll actually go into its burrow. Uh, and that will drop its temperature down some so it can come back out uh, and the temperature goes up and the lizard can be really inactive and this can give the lizard a chance to even be active uh, a little bit after the sun uh, has gone down because of the ambient temperature is still out there and so is its body temperature. Um, so you know, warming up throughout the day to then be active at night when it's cooler um, is certainly a strategy for some um, ectothermic animals. <clears throat> Um, it's also important to note that um, some snakes and I think some lizards as well have a certain body temperature that they need to reach in order to digest or that does not happen. And so um, I mentioned this before with uh, in, in earlier programs where some snakes, um, when they hibernate, they stop eating weeks to a month or, or more before they hibernate, uh, before they go into uh, brumation, excuse me, for the winter because um, their body will not be able to digest any food that they have, so they do not want to have a full belly uh, before they go into to brumation, so that anything that's in their belly couldn't, you know, possibly even rot or or um, get really nasty. So, whoops, didn't Dad, do that. Yes. This is Melanie. Okay. Do, do you know brumation uh, is what hibernation? Say that again. Brumation. Brumation is is the the reptile is is a better term to use for hibernation in reptiles. Hibernation really part of that word is really meant to refer to mammals because it's about a, a severe drop in body temperature, which normally would be unhealthy, um, and it doesn't really apply to reptiles because they do have uh, their body temperature will go up and down. So brumation is is a better term for that winter that time of inactivity during winter that reptiles go through so that is for reptiles yes amphibians i, I think maybe amphibians uh somewhat but i know for sure for for reptiles it's a good term okay no, no worries um and then endotherms which is which is includes us these are animals that maintain a body temperature uh and again it's within narrow limits and it's uh by means of inter internal mechanisms obviously we also have some behaviors that we do you know obviously as humans we put on jackets or we put on um 
a lot less closed in, in the summer to allow any excess heat to to um, go on there. You know, we increase our fluid intake and, and things like that. Uh, in this picture, you can see us an American Robin up on a snag and it's the middle of a hot day in July. And he's got his mouth open just like the, the blue footed booby at the beginning of the program. Uh, there's a little bit of panting there and breathing. And uh, and I'll talk more about how that works for, for birds in a little bit. Um, so if we talk about endotherms, we also got to mention homeotherms. These are organisms whose body temperature varies only within their limbs, meaning their entire body has, maintains its temperature. There are ectotherms that can also be homeotherms because, uh, and, a lot, and, and the majority of these are um, aquatic animals, but they are quite large. I think um, sea turtles is a good example. Even though they're ectothermic and their body can uh, be influenced by the, the temperature around it, the temperature around them is often very stable, and so they don't experience this, those fluctuations. So they're not really poikilothermic because they don't go up and down because the media, the um, environment they're in, in this case, say tropical you know, ocean waters, is very stable in temperature. Um, if you've ever, so I grew up in the Great Lakes uh, to give you an idea of how this works, and you could go swimming. Sometimes in September when it'd be kind of cool, September, October, which I know is laughable down here, but it, it could seem relatively cool to go swimming, but the lake water is still very warm. Uh, some of it's because of sun radiation, but some of it's just, it still has this thermal inertia, meaning it hasn't lost its heat yet like the air has. The air changes much more quick, quickly where it takes water longer to heat up, if you've ever boiled it, uh, and also longer to cool back down than the, than the air around it. And so... You could go very, you could go swimming, you know, late in the season where it seems the air is really cool and it's actually warmer to keep, stay down until like your chin in the water. I love doing that. Whereas, you know, in late spring, the water still might be pretty cold because it hasn't fully warmed up yet. Um, and so that's how, but, you know, in, in a really warm water, you could have that, that, um, that thermal inertia or even stasis that, that helps keep it warm for, for large turtles. I think that might be, oh, okay. Um, if you're homeothermic, you probably need less, you know, a, a less of an array of enzymes, but you also have a very narrow range of which you can be active in as opposed to say this lizard whose body temperature changes throughout the day, but can be active in a very large range of body temperatures. So there's, um, advantages and disadvantages. The advantage here is, um, you know, having a body temperature that's the same, that there are certain, you know, you don't have to worry about getting your body temperature to um, a certain temperature in order for certain bodily functions to happen. They all happen because you're always going to be within this range. On the other hand, if you're in this wide range of body temperatures, you're not eating to maintain that temperature. Homeothermic animals, endothermic animals have to maintain their temperature uh, through consumption of, uh, of energy, through consumption of food. And so, the food needs between an animal like a mouse uh, versus a lizard or a rat versus a lizard of comparable size is very different. And the lizard's food needs is a fraction of what the rat or the mouse needs. Uh, and that is because of um, the, the rat or mouse or rat is, is trying to maintain its body temperature, whereas the lizard's body temperature is influenced by ambient temperatures and behaviors. And it's not necessarily um, influenced by the food they eat so they can eat less because that's not going to determine their body temperature. Excuse me. I like having the air conditioner on me, but it also can make me congested sometimes. Um, so I also want to mention heterothermy. Um, I talked about this briefly. Uh, I did a wintertime economics um, presentation back in, I think, December, and I talked about how the counter current circulation of um, birds, especially birds with webbed feet that you'll see sitting on the ice, uh, Canada geese and gulls, you'll see them out there sitting on the ice and they're web, bare webbed feet. Uh, and I've always, always wondered, like, you know, just like our tongue, how that doesn't stick to the ice while they're sitting there. Well, they have this counter current exchange where the warm blood comes out in the arteries and before it gets to the foot, the heat is transferred to the veins because the heat, the artery, outgoing artery and the incoming vein are so close together that the heat transfer happens here. So the heat is not lost to the environment out through the webbed foot. So even though 
<clears throat> even though this is really cool, no heat is lost because this heat already went here to um, the very cool blood coming back in. Um, this is this is fascinating. And, and, uh, this has always been one of my favorite facts about bird feet. Um, I just recently learned that what this is what this is called is there are these pockets here. This is this is one that's in in sheep. Um, and I wish I could remember for the life of me because I pulled the, um, how this actually benefits the sheep. Um, but this is called radiant mirabil. I this word right here. These two words are in the M. I, I know I, I can't pronounce it. And I couldn't find a pronunciation. Um, but this is a, a pocket where um, arteries and veins are in close proximity, and they can allow for a close exchange of um, uh, essentially a property because it can be temperature, but it also could be a pH. It also could be water, so it's not lost. So this kind of structure is here in the bird's legs, so they're not losing heat to the outside because they're so close together, they're exchanging the heat and no heat is lost to the environment. Um, what that also means is the bird's feet, as you can see from this diagram, are much colder than the main, than the, the body of the bird, the, the main body of the bird itself. And this is called heterothermy, where in, uh, in an organism, there are regions that are different temperatures from other regions. Um, and I don't have I don't have a really good link for this to um, dealing with the heat, but I did want to mention it um, because it's a fascinating um, it is a fascinating adaptation. Um, and as I was just talking about homeothermy in in, in sea turtles, because even though they are um, uh, considered ectothermic, they maintain a pretty uh, constant body temperature. This is a, a leatherback sea turtle, uh, and they are actually heterothermic because as they swim, uh, when they move these these large flippers, um, they actually generate heat from the from the the muscles that are using to 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 swim. And structures again like this, really wish I could pronounce that. But these kinds of structures in come on in the um, in, inside the leatherback conserve heat that is produced from the flippers and transfer it to the rest of the body to maintain uh, a core body temperature. So it helps them um, in in waters that might be a little cooler uh, and it helps them, again, conserve that body heat. <clears throat> so let's talk about these guys. And, and here's two examples I really like to talk about, which is um, these are our dragonflies. The, the one on the left is a common green darner. Uh, and the one on the right is a blue dasher. And they're both hanging out here and they are looking to uh, get some warmth. It's, it's early. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. This guy here, you can actually see, uh, if, you, if, you, if you go out uh, in the middle of the day and look for a common green darner, you're going to find a green thorax and a light blue abdomen. However, this abdomen has got a dark streak down here. And what they're able to do is they're actually able to concentrate pigments into the, the the thorax here so that excuse me into the abdomen so that it will absorb warm uh warmth faster radiation from the sun faster warm them up quicker because dragonflies um are one of those ectotherms that really need a lot of energy they need a lot of heat energy in order to do what they're doing because it that that um they're operating four wings they're Four wings are beating very fast, and they're also moving independently of another of each other. So they need a lot of energy uh, in order to to be active, because then they're also hunting other insects. So they want to be quick, they want to be fast, they want to be agile. So they need uh, warm days. So on a you know it might be like 70, 75, but if it's overcast and cool, it's it's not the best day to go looking for dragonflies. You know, um, people always tell me I'm crazy because I like I like going out in, in the middle of a really hot warm day and this next week's gonna be really hot and really warm but that's a really good time to see dragonflies because that hot weather really gets them active so um as this dragonfly warms up that dark band will disappear and this will all be be light blue and it'll be ready to go now here's a blue whoops not yet it's my surprise here's a blue dasher and the blue dasher is you can see it's very much horizontal it's it's got its body in a position where it's, it's really soaking up the warmth of the sun once you get too hot that becomes an issue if you're a, a warm-blooded animal um excuse me if you're endothermic uh 
warps can feel really comfortable to a point, but then there comes a time where you want to shed that heat, especially in the summer. If you're exothermic and you're depending on an outside source of heat to warm up, there does you do reach a point where you could get too hot. And so how do you turn off um, absorbing ambient heat from the environment. So I want to talk a little bit about that, which is, you know, obviously dealing with the heat. So this blue dasher here, now I can do it. Um, in this picture, this blue dasher is, is doing something called obelisking, and you'll see um, many different dragonflies do that. It is no longer sitting flat and trying to take as much heat from the sun. It is now sitting with its abdomen uh, straight up, uh, and so it's reducing the amount of surface area that's directly um, receiving heat uh, radiation from the sun uh, and this is a way of reducing the amount of heat that it, that's currently being loaded for this blue dasher this is a male this blue dasher is going to spend a lot of time defending territory um, so they can find a female and oftentimes what that means is being out in an exposed area so that you can be seen hey this is my place look at me ladies um, but that also means you're going to be out in the sun so this is one method of reducing heat loading from the sun while still being exposed so you can be seen uh, maintaining the territory you're looking for. Um, again, you're out there, you're basking, you've warmed up to the point where you don't want to get much warmer. So so what do you do? A uh, couple strategies. One is avoidance. It's hot out. I'm going to find some shade. That could be uh, a burrow under the ground where temperatures are a little uh, less um, uh, changeable they don't go up as down uh, they don't fluctuate as much uh it could be just hiding on the underside of a leaf like these caterpillars and this walking stick they could be taking a dip in the water or again like this um garter snake this is actually the step right outside uh, the office here uh he's just in a, a little hidey hole where it's shady but all these are removing yourself from directly from the sun um or at least getting yourself into uh, a place where it is cooler so that you can your body temperature won't overheat. Um, soaring birds, you got a turkey vulture and a red shoulder hawk and, and a raven here. They um, can escape the heat, even though it seems counterintuitive because they're out in the open and they're right under the sun, but at those higher altitudes, temperatures are lower. And so that is another way to beat the heat as to get out there and get soaring. And um, as though it's like a positive feedback loop, the heat, um, the, the the sun heats the air, hot air rises, and that helps um, produce uh, the currents that they need to, to keep themselves aloft. Um, so that really can be uh, beneficial for them. So another way of avoiding the sun is, even though you're out in front of it, is being up higher where there's cooler temperatures. Um, this is a strategy that humans uh, use very often too. I watched, um, um, Humans do this a lot during uh, when I lived in Colorado because uh, one of the places to go was in the mountains. So in the summer, was, even when it was warm, you could um, head out to uh, one of the national parks or head up into some of the 14ers. Uh, and once you got up high, you actually needed a sweatshirt because it was still really cool, even though it was June or July. Um, but you need a mountain to do that. These guys don't need a mountain. Uh, another way of avoiding it is just come out at night. Uh, there's a lot of reasons to come out at night. It's harder to be seen. Um, maybe that's when your food comes out. But uh, a really good reason for for being nocturnal or coming out at night is to avoid the heat. Um, copperheads spend a lot of time in the spring hunting during the day, but as temperatures warm up, copperheads move more and more to being nocturnal hunters. This is something I talked about a couple deep dives ago. Um, so they change their habits as the, the temperatures get warmer and warmer. Um, and again, depending on where you are is, is a uh, an ectotherm wherever you absorb your heat if there's a way for you to absorb your heat without being in the sun and then you're able to use that heat to hunt when it's cooler um that can be a big advantage and again also depending on when the food you eat comes out um or you can take it to an extreme like this guy this is the eastern redback salamander probably the most common salamander there's probably hundreds of them out in our woods um and what they do during the summer is they just estivate you've got um period when it's hot when it's dry um these guys are uh these salamanders are really easy to find in the spring and the um uh, fall but in the summer uh, it's difficult if not impossible because they they estimate they'll actually go into what's like a second type of hibernation 
where they're inactive um, during these periods. See, I think you know, when you talk about deserts, when you talk about places that have really episodic rains, uh, rainy seasons and dry seasons, um, there's a lot of really good examples. One of those is the, um, and this is like, this is our local example. Um, it's a small guy and it, it's a small salamander. I don't think people really are that aware or you miss it very often. Um, but one example is the um, African lungfish. And this is a, a mud ball that has a African lungfish cocoon in it. And uh, for several months, they might cocoon up into and, and, and lay dormant. They may estivate uh, during the dry season until the rainy season comes back. Uh, and so this is a really prolonged period of, of inactivity. But it's a, one way, again, of avoiding the heat, uh, and in this case, also a, a very dry season. Another way to change your look. Um, and again, you know, for us, we have warm things we wear in the winter. We have cooler things or just less of things that we wear in the summer. Um, this is from Sibley's, um, where's that book? This is from the Sibley Guide to Bird Life and Behavior. I can't see my screen, so I don't know if it's showing up, but I'll, I can show it to you again. Uh, it's a great book uh, if you're really interested in birds and talks about the different groups. Um, but this illustration is just fantastic. You know, on the left is a cardinal that you might see in the middle of winter, and on the right is a cardinal that you might see in the middle of summer. It's the same bird, roughly same size. It's not as if that bird has, has really bulked up or really fattened up for the winter. It's fluffing its feathers. And they're able to fluff their feathers up to the point uh, on the left where they can really trap a, a, a dense, you know, a, a layer of air against their body uh, and keep that superheated. And that keeps them warm throughout the, um, you know, keep them warm on really, really cold days. And I think we've all experienced those days where you come out of, I know I have, where I come out in the morning, I'm like, wow, oh, this is cold. And I'll look around and see a bird fluffed up on the I'm like, oh, yeah, it definitely is cold. If they're feeling it like that. Um, and again, you know, it, it looks like a leaner, meaner bird there on the right. Same bird, just they've got the feathers pressed tight against their body so they're not creating uh, a layer of air that's going to trap heat. They want to make sure that any excess heat is being uh, released and so that they're not trapping that heat against their body. Uh, and just a reminder, um, this is from a, a different book called Winter World by Bernd Heinrich, another one I recommend. And he's got a, a summer world as well. Um, you know, if this is the feather and the plumage, feathers and the plumage of a bird, this is a golden crowned kinglet, which is a tiny bird. The bird is even tinier than the plumage you're looking at, that the feathers can fluff out and make it look bigger. And part of that is to help trap, you know, an insulating layer of, of warmed air against the body. Uh, and so this was a, an illustration he drew to show the difference between a, a uh, what a kinglet would look like with all its feathers and what the uh, bird looks like without. Uh, and so, you know, transfer that to a larger bird like um, the cardinal or even larger birds like a uh, hawks and, and eagles, that that ratio of um, size that the, the feathers give versus what's actually underneath there is, is fairly accurate. Uh, for mammals, um, it's all about, you know, shedding twice a year. You shed in the spring, get rid of that warm, thick, longer fur uh, and grow in a layer of fur that's that's cooler, that is uh, shorter, that's thinner, that allows heat loss more regularly. And then you switch it back out to the longer, thicker fur that's going to trap heat against the body more readily uh, in the fall. Um, and this is a deer from Shenandoah, but if you look, you can see different, different color patches uh, along the deer's flank there where it was... Um, I think this picture was taken in, in April or May, and it's this deer was definitely in the midst of uh, sh shedding uh, its older uh, winter fur or pelage for its uh, spring pelage. Um, this isn't something that animals actively do, but one of the things you can notice it's called Bergman's rule. It's not entirely airtight, but it's a it's a really good rule. If you look at similar kinds of animals look at them in the tropics versus look at them in the Arctic versus, you know, um, the temperate regions in between, you will often notice that the animals like this red fox uh, that are further north tend to be larger than this, which is an Asian desert red fox, which is much smaller and lives obviously in a desert in a very warm area. You can also see that that its fur is very, excuse me, it's very light, it's very 
uh, short. It's d definitely there. That kind of fur is definitely um, very good at allowing uh, heat loss to occur. And again, the um, the red fox here. Excuse me. <laughs> My goodness. Excuse me. The red fox is larger. It's got a thicker body. It's also got a thicker um, coat of fur around it to help keep that that uh, that heat in. Uh, and this is something that you can see. Another great example, if you want to do a Google search, is just uh, if you can find uh, somebody who's uh, got pictures together, is look at deer like key deer from uh, Florida versus the the white-tailed deer you'll see up here or even further north in. Um, uh, in Canada, and you'll notice there's very much a, a size difference between them, even though they're very similar. I think key deer might even just be a subspecies of, of the white-tailed deer. So you see a very big size difference between them. Just like you can look at um, you know, smaller mammals in the tropics versus the large mammals that tend to be uh, something that you see more often along the in the uh, Arctic areas, things like uh, moose or you know, you can go further north like muskox. Um, and so that's what Bergman's rule is about. And again, the bigger the body, the higher the ratio of volume to surface area. I hope I'm saying that right. And so uh, the the less the the less heat is lost because there's more volume uh, to a, a lesser amount of surface area. Surface area. So if you can't avoid the heat, well, try panning. If you've got a dog, you 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 see this. Um, mammalian respiration is it's in it's out it's pretty quick it's not fairly complicated birds will pant during the heat too um but their panting is actually uh, in many ways just like their breathing can be much more efficient when a bird breathes in air comes in via the trachea and it goes into these posterior air sacs this is on breath one these blue arrows this is also from the sibling guide uh on their next breath the air from these posterior air sacs excuse me, gets pushed into the lungs uh, and it'll be pushed back into the anterior sac before anterior air sac before it leaves. So and birds take the way birds take breath with all this happening. A, a bird's breath pretty much clears out the previous air that was in there, whereas for mammals, I think it might only be like 20 or 30 percent so we we leave a fair amount of air still in our lungs. But for birds, the air goes in, it goes out. It's very efficient. So when a bird, check my, yeah, when a bird is is, is um, panting, if you've ever seen a bird pant, uh, cormorants, pelicans, it's very obvious when they do it. Um, if you've ever seen a bird look like it's panting and its neck is fluttering, that's called a guler fluttering, and they are making the, the air um, go in and out even more rapidly. The air is coming in and it's um, it, causing uh, moisture within these within these air sacs to evaporate. This is why I talked about heat and evaporation earlier. It's causing the the um, uh, moisture in these lungs to uh, these air sacs to evaporate, uh, and that uh, is causing heat to be lost, and so it helps to cool it. And so it's very very efficient. And it's the same can be said, you know, with with uh, mammals when they pant. They are um, panning quickly. They're getting that uh, air exchange in, and it's allowing uh, evaporation to occur. And 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 um, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, it's allowing the body to cool. It also has one of the costs it have, which I think should be obvious, is is, is moisture loss. You know, it's one of the reasons that if your dog is panting, if it's a hot day. Panting isn't always a bad thing, but you want to make sure your dog has lots of water because if it's panting, it's losing moisture. Um, here is one of the champions of guler fluttering. This is a nighthawk, uh, and this picture was taken. Uh, oh, I can't remember something city. So, but it's Midwest. But it was like an eighty or ninety degree day, and this guy is just sitting here in this mixed gravel in the middle of the sun, um, and their feathers actually help protect them from the sun. They're actually helping to keep the heat out, just like they would help to keep the heat in, uh, and the nighthawk is doing a lot of guler fluttering as well uh and they will nest right on the ground they will just lay the eggs right on the ground no nest at all um and then they will sit there and protect the the eggs uh and they will do this guler fluttering to protect them during the heat 
Uh, and one of the things that common night hawks are, are, are very well known for is nesting on the top of flat buildings. If you've got a flat roof, you might get these night hawks. The problem is, um, not everybody's always very happy about that. I think it'd be really cool to have these guys on a on a flat roof if I had one. Um, but they are able to deal with those temperatures by this guler fluttering, which allows evaporation from uh, the air sacs inside uh, their body, and so it help really helps them uh, reduce their heat their heat stress. Um, this is cool. I'm going a little far afield here with the uh, whoops, with the camel, uh, but temperature cycling. Camels live in a very hot environment. The desert can be really hot. One of the things they do during the day, I mentioned the uh, obelisking of the dragonflies. Camels will sit facing the sun, and what that actually does is cut down on their heat profile, which is like the dragonfly. It's the amount of their body that's actually in direct uh, line of the sun and receiving the radiation from the sun. The other thing they will do is, even though they're endothermic, their body temperature will fluctuate during the day and they can allow their body to actually rise, uh, their body temperature to rise to help um, absorb some of that heat and to make it to not, uh, so that the heat is not as much of an issue. And then they can actually shed that heat during the night. And so their body temperature can change about six degrees Celsius, which is about, uh, 11 or 12 degrees Fahrenheit. So, you know, if you do the math, you think we're 98 degrees. If you go up five degrees, you've got a serious fever. Um, I'm not as uh, sure about how many degrees low you have to go to be hypothermic, but, um, you know, just rising five degrees Fahrenheit, that's not even Celsius, is, is can be a, um, a pretty serious medical condition. And these guys are doing twice that just to get through the heat of the, the day. You know, it's just a regular day for a camel. So it's pretty neat. We do have something similar here, not that I'm aware of in the summer, but in the winter, uh, one of the things I've talked about before is how chickadees, uh, among other birds, will do this, where in order to survive throughout the night, they'll actually let their body temperature drop lower than, we, you know, something that we would be able to do to help conserve the amount of uh, calories or energy they use staying warm throughout the, the cold uh, winter night, which is also much longer than the nights we experience uh, during the summer. Um, and I just, one last little one here to, um, this is kind of an interesting uh, heat adaptation. I thought this is a uh, beetle uh, in the Namib desert, which is on the coast of Africa. Um, and you can see it's really raised up, trying to reduce its contact with the sand as much as possible during the heat of the day. But in the morning, uh, when the cool, moisture-laden air, uh, the breezes are coming in from the ocean, the beetle will orient itself uh, to take advantage of these uh, these breezes. Uh, you can see the bumps on the beetle's uh, shell. Uh, it's carapace there, the, it's, uh, the elytra. And what happens is the, the, be the bumps are actually hydrophilic, meaning they attract and hold oxygen. So water will begin to condense and um, form little droplets on the back of the beetle and then the beetle arranges itself this picture is not doesn't have the handstand but it'll actually arrange itself in a handstand so the end of the abdomen is up in the air and the head is down low and as these um, bumps continue to attract oxygen uh, water at some point the <clears throat> water droplet becomes so heavy that it will note that the hydrophilic uh, quality of the bump no longer holds it and it'll begin to roll down the beetle's back. The beetle also has hydrophobic little canals that will guide that water to the head of the beetle where it will then drink the water. And this is how they get uh, the water that they survive on. And there's also some evidence that they are able to um, obtain water from uh, fog and, and misty air as well. Um, but just catching these moisture laden breezes coming in off the this ocean with this um, amazing uh, array of adaptations on the back of the beetle I just thought was fantastic and again you know the the um, I could do a whole other program dealing with heat on just what goes on in the deserts there's a, a lot of different adaptations out there but it all comes back to maintaining your body temperature so that the enzymes that are doing all of the things that are, are essentially what we call life are able to function within the narrow temperature ranges that they need. Um, and again, like I said, they also need um, a certain amount of 
a substrate and they need a certain amount, a certain pH. And so that's a whole other story. I'm just dealing with one category of needs for these uh, enzymes, which is which is temperature. So um, thank you all uh, for being here tonight. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions. I'm actually going to pop, stop sharing my screen here so I can come back up and see if anybody has any questions. I'm going to check the chat, but if you have a question and you'd like to unmute. I do. I do. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Okay. So, so deer, white tail deer. Okay. I think they have husks in their legs to keep them warm in the winter. They have what in their legs? The, the, the vein artery. It's it's possible. I wouldn't be surprised. They spend a lot of time in, um, you know, snowy conditions, especially the further north you go in their range. So it certainly would be a, a really good um, um, adaptation. It, yeah, um, I, I think it's the, the vein okay. that they go in the hoof. It kind of like sheet. Oh, yeah. You know, that, that makes a lot of sense because otherwise I can't imagine my toenails constantly be dipped in snow. That would drive me nuts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but they you know, you find their burrows in the snow. In oh, the yeah. Or not burrows, but, you know, they're, they're a little... Where old. they dead down for the night. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah they tuck their legs in, so... Mm -hmm. yeah. Hey, uh, I see Eileen, your question. Um, so the bumps were hydrophilic. Philic means water, or it means love or attraction. So hydrophilic is water-loving. And then there were also little canals uh, on the shell of the beetle that are hydrophobic. And that means they do not, it does not attract water, it can actually repel. So the bumps draw in the water, they're hydrophilic. And then when the water gets, the, the droplets of the water get so big that they can't hold on again, just like, you know, if you're holding water, if you got water streaming down your finger, at some point it'll, it'll um, form a drop and then drop because water wants to stay together. But at some point, the, the weight of the water droplet overpowers that electrostatic for hydrostatic force um when the water droplet begins to stream down the beetles back they enter they go into these canals and because the canals are hydrophobic they allow the water to keep moving they don't make the water won't stick to it so hydrophilic means the water will stick to it hydrophobic means it won't so once the so water gathers on these bumps and then when it starts to when it's going to start to run down the beetle's back, they end up in these canals, and the canals direct the water directly to the beetle's head, and that's how it—that's how they drink. Has anyone tried to develop technology to do what those beetles do? Yes, um, I was actually reading about them today on um, uh, Wikipedia, and somebody had. There was a company that is mentioned in it. Sometimes on Wikipedia, what will happen because you got all these people adding to it. Someone's like, this is what I think about this. And they just add this um, part that can seem kind of random. And then in later edits, it, it, it ends up out of there. Uh, but somebody did put in uh, an, an article about it that there was a company trying to develop um, technology based on this. But what often happens with something like that is where that might work very well on the small scale of the beetle's back. Here's a little knob and it's hydrophilic, it gathers water out of the air and then these small canals direct that water down. It might not be something that's gonna work on a big on a big scale. A lot of times there's these really cool ideas and we learn these great adaptations or we see these really neat um, science ideas from nature. Uh, and again, I don't wanna poo poo them, but what ends up happening is once you get to the point where you're trying to scale up, uh, and make it work on an industrial level or on a some kind of level where it's both um, feasible to do it economically, but then also to the point where it'll be a benefit to people. It doesn't fit it. It doesn't make it because it can't be scaled up from that small thing or from that small structure. In this case, the beetle is not very big at all. So I would be surprised to see if it's something that they can scale up to a a um a level where it might be good for people maybe it's something they can get for uh, livestock or for irrigation but i don't know if that's something that they can scale up that it would be uh, usable for humans perhaps anybody else have a question i know i uh ended a little early there i've got um, another one sure um can animals be a mixture of these 
think like the Beatles is like can you be like uh you know uh, I don't know uh, you know like ectothermic but under certain circumstances but something else under others are you only one kind of thing so you're you're I think you're either ectothermic or you're endothermic because either you have you're either endothermic and you have an internal mechanism that's going to help you maintain your body temperature or you're ectothermic and you don't have any internal mechanisms to maintain your body temperature and so you're subjected to whatever amb ambient temperature is so then you have to depend on smaller be physiological uh, adaptations or behavioral adaptations in order to stay in the narrow range of, of uh, temperatures you need to be. Um, and so that's okay. why when I went for, I went from ectothermic and endothermic, I also talked about homeothermic and poikilothermic because homeo there are ectothermic homeotherms and there are endothermic homeotherms. So there are. Um, yeah, could you? Yeah. So there's um, the ectothermic endothermic is actually binary. It's like that's like a big divider. I think so. I think so. I, I think so yeah. And but then you can't always say. Have, oh, go ahead. So within those, you would have adaptations, right, yeah. to yeah. climate and temperature. Yeah. Right. And so what often most of these animals have some adaptations that are either physiological or behavioral that that help them to to stay in those narrow ranges. Because even though, again, our body temperature is ninety eight point six, but I can't walk out there uh, in you know I can't walk out there this week in a fur coat and um, you know thick line boots and a wool hat and expect to stay at 98.6 in the sun on a 90 or 100 degree day so uh, you know there are some behavioral things that are involved uh that that have to happen um to be honest i with the temperatures with that they say are coming i don't know if i can walk out in shorts and a t-shirt and maintain 98.6 for very long either you know if we're, we're gonna get hit with a, a pretty good heat wave and so Behavioral adaptations are still very important, even when you have physiological adaptations that are maintaining a certain temperature for you. Okay, thanks. Sure, sure. <clears throat> Any other questions? I've got another one. Sure, sure. The 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 um the thing that the birds do, the panting, the mm -hmm. gling, is it you said? Uh, uh the gooler fluttering. Gooler fluttering. Yeah, G U L A R fluttering. Okay, G G U L A R. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and I've seen I've seen you know I've seen chickens do that, but I've definitely seen uh, a lot of, um, I've definitely seen both cormorants and pelicans do it. If you're if you're ever near either of those birds on a hot day, it's it'll be pretty obvious because you'll see the the neck fluttering uh, with their as their mouth is open and, and they're panting, um, and that that neck fluttering. Is, is simply making that air more rapid. It's really helping cool them. I'd like to be able to do it, but I'm sure I'd look pretty odd if I could do it. So, well, uh, thank you everybody for coming. Um, you're always welcome to email me um, afterwards if you have any questions. Um, I'll probably stop the recording here in another second or two, and uh, I will definitely uh, send out an email to everybody when it's posted, and I'll also. Uh, and you're welcome, Eileen. Thank you. Um, and you're, uh, you know, again, welcome to rewatch it. Uh, email with any questions, and then I will. Uh, I think Maddie has. Um, uh, if you haven't met her yet, she is the uh, other naturalist here at Gulf Ranch Nature. Or maybe she's the naturalist, and I'm the other naturalist. Um, but she will be doing top predators of the DMV in about two weeks on the 23rd. Um, which is, I believe, an adults-only program similar in the format. And then I'll be doing another deep dive on spiders in August. I'm super excited to, to, to get in on that one. Uh, and then she will be doing decomposers and scavengers uh, next month as well. So we got a lot of good stuff. So I hope to see uh, you all then. Uh, and thank you. Uh, thank you, Deborah. That's really kind. Um, so I'm going to say... Uh, bid you guys all do have a great Thursday night um, and we'll see you sometime soon. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. No problem. Have a great night. Thanks.